of the commonest jokes about Asians in television comedy today is that they work too hard. Good evening, please. Ah, oh, Ranjit, you're late. I thought you weren't coming. You've missed the first half of the session. I am working from 6 o'clock morning time until 2 o'clock afternoon time. Then I'm doing other job for garage, pumping the petrol. So, Asians work too hard. The implication is that they're probably taking away somebody else's job. Unless, that is, they're too busy scrounging off the dole. You're unemployed. Yes, please. <laughs> and if they do work, they're probably too stupid to understand about trade unions. Everybody who works here has to join the union. Ah, so you are also a member of union? Uh, no. Uh, no, no, he doesn't work here. He's just the management. What? <laughs> now, you see, we operate a closed shop. Shop? Is this not a factory? Oh, yes, it is. It's just an expression we use. It's no good, Paddy. She comes from overseas. She doesn't understand the way we talk. Here's a positive image of Asian women of a kind we don't see very often on television. When they do defy the media stereotype and fight for trade union recognition, as here at Grunwick's, they're cast in the image of troublemakers. Here comes the John Wayne of racism striding out of the West. For a man who didn't form his party until earlier this year, Kingsley Reed's achievement has been remarkable. And no one questions that the success has been based on his open distaste for the colored immigrants and his demands for their immediate repatriation. When did building up a successful racist party become, in the BBC's language of neutrality, a remarkable achievement? Can you imagine a report describing the rise of the Black Panthers as a remarkable achievement? Bob Butterick lives on the huge Stonebridge estate. Here, white families are outnumbered three to one by blacks. What is it that really upsets you about this estate? Well, it's the, the vandalism, the noise. You uh, come out your street door, you ask to be quiet in a nice way, and they just look at you, going away trash. Blacks may outnumber whites by three to one, but the BBC seemed to have trouble finding them. David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, wanted by the Home Office and the police as an illegal entrant, is actually in a television studio. You are reported as having a message for the people of Britain. What is your message to the people of Britain, essentially? One of the main things is that they're not alone, that there are white people all over the globe that, that sympathize with... When last did you hear a television interviewer say, Mr. Fidel Castro, I understand you have a message for the British people. This isn't giving the racists enough rope to hang themselves with. It's allowing them to get away with murder, and all the time in the name of balance and good journalism. We take a penetrating look at racism on television, using the BBC as an example, tonight on Alternative Views. pleased to have as our guest tonight Chris Thomas, who's an English filmmaker and video activist who produced, his group produced, the film New Technology, Whose Progress, that we showed you earlier on the effects of computers and automation on the workplace. And tonight, Chris has brought a videotape with him that his group made in England on racism in the media. So welcome to Alternative Views, Chris, and you. thank you for bringing your tape. Before we talk to Chris, let's have some news stories. Remember when the top news story concerned the American helicopter that was shot down just over the Nicaragua border by the Nicaraguans? Well, there was an interesting story in The Guardian this week that explained what was really going on. According to this report, the U.S. helicopter, which had penetrated at least six miles into Nicaraguan territory, was part of a whole strategic arsenal of American helicopters 
who over the last couple of weeks had been regularly flying into Nicaragua to provide air cover and support for the counter-revolutionary Somosistas that have been attacking the Sandinista government with CIA report. They also indicated in this article in The Guardian how one after another of the explanations of the Reagan administration of how the helicopter got so far into Nicaragua had been refuted by Honduras soldiers who were on the border. For instance, the official report was that it was cloudy and there was heavy wind that blew the helicopter into Nicaragua and it lost its ways. However, the Honduras soldiers who were there on the scene indicated that it was a sunny day and the wind was blowing the other direction, that, in, that is, into Honduras and not into Nicaragua, putting a hole in that report. Moreover, they reported that in the two-week period during which the helicopter was shot down, there was particularly intense fighting between the counter-revolutionaries and the Sandinista government. It was claimed that during the two-week period in which the plane was shot down, 300 Somosista counter-revolutionaries were shot down, and that the American helicopters were regularly providing intelligence information, cover, uh, and were just monitoring the whole uh, thing. So what this indicates is a significant new level of U.S. military involvement that was simply covered up in the press that made it appear that the Sandinistas shot down this nice U.S helicopter that accidentally went astray into that country. And it looks now, Doug, like the U.S. may be going it alone in Nicaragua against the, against the Sandinistas. Argentina's new president, Raul Alfonsín, has told the Reagan administration he will halt his country's involvement in that country. Now, the extent of the Argentine involvement has never really been made clear. But when Alfonsín's government took office, they discovered a bunch of papers in the Argentine Defense Ministry that indicating, quote, an almost unbelievable sum of money had been channeled secretly into Central America. As a result, when the Reagan administration decided also to support the Contras, they were able to buy into an existing operation and not have to start from scratch. Now, this article, which is from the Washington Post National Weekly, said that at the instigation of Reagan's first Secretary of State, Alexander Haig, the administration also embarked on a high-priority campaign of trying to coax Argentina e and even into even closer collaboration in Central America. Now, this U.S. courtship was so intense that it is known to have been a major factor in convincing General Galtieri, who was then the Argentine military commander, that if he invaded the Falklands, the United States would prevent Britain from striking back. And you know how that went. There was another interesting story about Argentina itself that was reported in The Guardian and that I read frequently when I was down in Mexico over Christmas vacation that reported how the new president of Argentina, Raul Alfonsín, three days after his election ordered military trials for nine generals and admirals that included three former presidents of Argentina on charges of murder, torture, illegal detention, etc. This is important because it's the first time that a fascist government that engaged in a coup d'etat and tortured and killed many people has been held accountable in Latin America for these crimes. The top leaders of this military government had been arrested and are now undergoing trial for all of the people that were killed, believed to be in the tens of thousands of people during the time that this military government had power in Argentina. Moreover, they've let back into the country a lot of the exiles, like Jacobo Timberman, who is the famous Jewish critic, liberal, of the Argentine military government, and people from all political persuasions are back in Argentina that's undergoing quite a rebirth of democracy, <coughs> debate about the issues, and looking into the past. So this is a significant fact that's going on in Latin America that must have the military juntas in Chile, Uruguay, Brazil, and some of these other countries a little bit worried. A little nervous. And now the centerpiece of our program, Racism on Television, featuring a British documentary and an interview with the man who produced and directed it. Could you tell us a little bit about the circumstances in which this videotape was made? Yes, this, we started work on this, in fact, way back in about 1978. And at that time, on both BBC and ITV, our main networks in Britain, um, 
racists were starting to be given more and more airtime and being given more and more credibility for a variety of reasons, but mainly because they basically produced fairly controversial television and that, if quotes, liberal mainstream television thought that they could contain racists, they could, thought they could bring them in, present their views, criticize them in a sort of way, but it would be, it would present an appetite to increase the controversy over their programs. We were very, very worried about that because they were giving more and more inflated importance and significance. And certainly the credibility of British television is very, very high. So when certain views are presented on those television, it rubs off on them. Those television, those, those views are substantiated and credibilized. And so it was a growing number of us as broadcasters, both in television and journalists and newsprint, that got together to present some kind of critique and start to sort of highlight this, uh, this practice to our peers and say this is, a, this is a very worrying practice and could have devastating uh, long-term effects. Um, in the short term, we didn't get very far. I mean, it's very, the sort of, if you like, smug arrogance amongst our peers that they were beyond criticism, uh, if you like. Well, it's like the networks here, really. Sure. And... Um, present us with a lot of problems. So in the end, we decided to apply for the one access spot that there is on BBC. It's called Open Door. And basically you write in, you get in a long queue of people because it's only half half an hour, goes out at 11.30 or did that at that time on a Sunday. And how frequently? Once a week? Once a week. And um, got in the queue. And fortunately, we ha had members and sympathizers within that open uh, community program unit. So we got a little leg up. <laughs> and in fact, a month later, lo and behold, we got uh, called in to make the program. Um, now, there was about half, a, or maybe even ten of us in the group, and while that process was going on, us getting in the queue and getting accepted, we were sitting there at home with our better maxes and video recorders, accumulating uh, enormous amounts of footage that we were quite critical of. Um, the main problem then was we had to go through the process of acquiring permission to use it. Now, needless to say, uh, you know, you ring up a producer and say, we're making a film about racism in television, we want to use your show. As an example, <laughs> as of, racism as an example of racist material. <laughs> that went down like a Led Zeppelin. So it took a lot of coercion and a lot of sort of disguised uh, approaches, <laughs> if you like, to actually get the material. And in fact, it took so long because people were so reluctant. Who are these guys criticizing us? What do you mean? Racist? BBC? Come off it, you know. Phone goes down. So uh, that they had to postpone the transmission of our program because we kept arguing that if we couldn't have the clips there was no evidence and it wouldn't we wouldn't be able to present a credible case so eventually bit by bit we accumulated um, enough stories because we wanted to show that the issue arose not just in say comedy programs where where there had already been some criticism of the nature of racist humor in British television but also in documentaries in news uh, current affairs and drama so uh, and we wanted to show that it wasn't just the prerogative of one particular television station that it was mainly a consensus television broadcast in Britain had ingrained racist streaks in it and that's what we wanted to dig out and reveal so uh, the one area which they just refused to actually budge on was news that was the holiest of holies the BBC news that God is speaking, that is truth, and you're not going to get in there and mess around in our archive and start saying that there is racist broke or racist undertones within the coverage of how news stories get selected. So most of the clips that we're actually going to see in this documentary came from documentaries that were okay. shown on BBC and yeah. the ITV, and the commercial station. That's anyway. right, and comedy sitcom programs. Right. We start off with that because mm. that is where the most obvious and least disguised element of racism goes on. Tell us a little bit about those first sitcoms that we're going to see because we probably don't know much about that. That's those. right. Well, um, basically, British people are infatuated by race. There's just no getting away with it. There's a whole element of consensus racism. And there's, in fact, almost and what, what we wanted to reveal, a kind of race league of which, obviously, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants are on the top of the first division. And then we look at the rest of the white British Commonwealth, and they're just below us. And then we go into uh, Europe, the French, the Germans, and then sort of starting into the third division, we're looking at Asia, and then way down in the bottom of the fourth division, there's Africa. And that sort of league determines how all stories are covered, the credibility, the sympathy, the authority, the way people are interviewed on those show, shows. So anyway, so there is this program called 
uh, Mind Your Language, which is about an evening class, an evening school, where foreign students go and to learn English. And it's called Mind Your Language. And there's, leading off the class, the lecturer in the class, is the archetypal nice, peaches and cream, wine English male, doing his best with all these conniving, stupid foreigners who can't get their act together to learn English. The uh, white man's burden. That's right. Well, well yes, <laughs> but I mean, it's like, and he's super efficient, the Mr. Nice Guy, and tolerant of all these excess, the excesses of these different, uh, the different groups. And they needed to say the bungling foreign, but each reproducing um, the stereotype demanded of them, the, you know, the sort of katowing Indian, Asian Sikh, um, there's Chinese, obviously, there's a sort of sexy Swedish girl, a French, a French woman. So all these stereotypes are at play. And it's grotesquely offensive. It reinforces all the kind of gut level stereotyping that goes on. But when it gets to TV, it even makes it worse because of the penetration and believability, isn't Particularly it? Particularly if the stereotypes show non-white people as inherently mm. inferior or comical, someone that you laugh at mm. as being foolish. Like the way they did with blacks in the United States for so many years on well, sitcoms. I mean, it's all part of the wider argument about the entertainment factory. Mm -hmm. If a producer only has two hours to make a show, he can't fool around, he can't rehearse people, so he gets nice little entertainers that can deliver the goods on pat without criticizing mm. them. And this is the way everyone slots into stereotypes. Types. You can think the storyline comes up and you can instantly cast it, instantly produce it, no one's going to fluff their lines, you're going to get laughter on cue, everything on cue, you're going to be out on time, going to be out on budget, you're, and you've done your job properly. I mean, that's all part of the problem. And they really don't reflect that it's precisely this format that targets the non-whites as the, uh, the targets of humor and objects of ridicule, and it's this format that is the vehicle of the racism Absolutely. in situation comedies. Could you tell us a little bit about how these racist documentaries were made, or how these documentaries gave such a predominant role to some of these racist spokespeople mm -hmm. who we see in these documentaries? How did they even get on British TV? Well, there's two elements. One is the, the first one, that uh, there's a problem going on. And needless to say, I mean, none of the broadcasters, needless to say, would dream of saying they're racist. In mm. fact, you know, they th think they're good liberal folk that are out there fighting consensus racism. But the way the stories are handled and the association of the language, I mean, as I think Stuart says in the film, if you only see a certain minority as being presented as a problem, and that's the only bracketed means that they're allowed to be shown on television, then you're automatically going to look down on these people if, they're, if the, the actual perspective is so narrow. Um, that's always going to create a problem. And that's one of the things we want to highlight is just actually it was truth by selection that, um, that was the problem. And they don't show the problem as being white. Never, never. Or if they do, it's always a white work. Here we have bigoted white working class people who, have right. a, you know, who don't like blacks, but us here, you know, in the middle class, of course we love them. We don't live near them. We don't work with them, but we get on fine with them. So because <laughs> there was controversy about the immigration policy in Britain and the amount of non-whites who had settled in Britain, mm. there were a lot of racists who wanted to kick them out of the country, mm. and so these people were news. Is that the thinking of the That's British right. TV people? That's so they right. had to interview some of the more inflammatory mm. and extreme of mm. these racist That's people right. because their views were getting the into the news. Is That's that right. the logic? That's right. I mean, they're always flirting with racists because right. they know at the same time it's going to sell newspapers, make people watch news programs. There's no question about it. The most well-known politicians in Britain, I bet it's in the same in this country too, mm. are the racist ones, mm. are the most reactionary ones. They're the ones that get the most airtime. They're yeah. the ones that, even if they're busy saying, oh, it's terrible, all these views are absolutely horrible, come on tell us a bit more so that we can criticize them. You so know? it legitimates the racist views yeah, by displaying them. Chris, why don't we take a look at this documentary and then maybe we can discuss the effects it had. As a final word before we see it, could you tell us something about who Stuart Hall is, who's one of the commentators? Yes, he's a sociology professor now with the Open University, our educational channel, and he had been very involved on, t uh, on criticism of the media, making an analysis on the way television works, and uh, in particular certain uh, analysis on racism in the media. So we uh, asked him, we invited him in. Uh, to uh, present the program. Um, traditionally, uh, on an access program, when the uh, BBC uh, give you airtime, 
what happens is, is that an announcer, the BBC announcer, comes in and says, and now we hand airtime over to a particular group. And this is outside the editorial control of the BBC. And this is a kind of government health warning to, to warn viewers <laughs> that uh, what you're seeing is basically slightly loony, slightly cranky, and nothing to do with the BBC, and be extremely cautious of it because it's probably propaganda. BBC and ITV are themselves biased and unbalanced, especially in the coverage they give to Britain's black community. Not only is a lot of this coverage not neutral, it actually reinforces racism. In the beginning, there was Lord Reef, the first Director General of the BBC. The interesting point in terms of social history is that this particular accent, which the BBC produced, somehow identified the BBC with a certain section of society, certain social trends, so that to this day, the BBC is thought of as the organ of the, as it were, genteel and respectable elements in society. Anything wrong with that? No, it's quite obvious. We've put out the most awful black in that village and something's got to be done to smooth it all over. First thing, of course, is to return their statue thing. Well, I'll take it back personal, sir. Have a parley with you, man. I've got a sort of knack of talking to these native wallers. Get on with that pandering, you prize-eating burk. <laughs> typical scene from a well-known comedy series. It's probably also fairly typical of what relationships were like between many white people and nations during the days of the British Empire. Lazy, skiving natives locked in a deceitful battle of wits against Lord Reith's genteel elements of society. How much do we pay the punk of Waller? Three new pieces a week, sir. Let's see, that's about four and six, isn't it? That's correct, sir. Doesn't seem very much, does it? Or would you give him a rise, say one more rupee? What do you think, Sergeant Major? Won't stop him falling asleep, sir. No, yeah, true. Besides, if we give one a rise, they'll all want it. We've only got one. <laughs> That's beside the point, Ashford. A thing like that can interfere with the whole structure of Indian society. You may think it's a good thing the British are able to laugh at their own past, but the British Empire was no joke for those on the receiving end. It's because of the poverty the Empire left behind that so many Asians and West Indians accepted invitations to come here after the war for work. So it's a bit of a turn-up for the books that one of the commonest jokes about Asians in television comedy today is that they work too hard. Good evening, please. Ah, oh, Ranjit, you're late. I thought you weren't coming. You've missed the first half of the session. A thousand apologies, but I'm falling asleep on the underground pew. I'm working from six o'clock morning time until two o'clock afternoon time. Then I'm doing other jobs for garage pumping the petrol until six o'clock evening time. Well, even for, uh, for the time you spend here, you could still have eight hours sleep. Oh, no. When I'm leaving here, I'm working in public house until after the midnight. I think you're overdoing it, Ranjit. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. This Jack, is he having three jobs also? <laughs> so, Asians work too hard. The implication is that they're probably taking away somebody else's job. Unless, that is, they're too busy scrounging off the dole. You're unemployed? Yes, please. <laughs> Only one day a week I'm working. Uh, what do you do then? I'm going to the unemployment exchange. <laughs> for to be collecting my money. Who oh, blimey. I get more money for not being working than when I'm working. <laughs> and if they do work, they're probably too stupid to understand about trade unions. Body who works here has to join the union. Ah, so you are also a member of union? Uh, no. Uh, no, no, he doesn't work here, he's just the management. <laughs> now, you see, we operate a closed shop. Shop? Is this not a factory? Oh, yes, it is. It's just an expression we use. It's no good, Paddy. She comes from overseas. She doesn't understand the way we talk. Here's a positive image of Asian women of a kind we don't see very often on television. When they do defy the media stereotype and fight for trade union recognition, as here at Grunwick's, they're cast in the image of troublemakers. So stereotypes do affect people's lives. The trouble is that you can laugh at the joke and accept the stereotype at the same time. 
After all, the media don't only give us information about the world we live in, they also shape our attitudes towards it. And jokes can strengthen our prejudices even while we're laughing at them. Last year at the Edinburgh Television Festival, the point was put to Michael Grade, program controller of London Weekend Television. I would like to ask you if you don't think that that is nothing but stereotypes based on the English attitude, which is all foreigners are funny, or wogs are funny, or Irish are funny, Greeks, everybody. Answer. I agree with you. I suppose any of you have a spare room, do you? It would give me much pleasure for you to share my humble house. But unfortunately, my cousin and his family, and also his cousin and his family, is staying with me. <laughs> You've got two families both living in one house? Two families both living in one room. <laughs> I don't think that series is socially damaging. I hope it isn't, otherwise we really oughtn't to be doing it. But I think that what people get out of that is a lot of enjoyment. I don't think it's at the expense of the characters. I think there is a, a multiracial community working in that classroom at some level, which is enjoyable, which may make people who are not members of any of those racial minorities friendlier towards the races that they see portrayed there without saying when they meet an Indian in the street uh, oh he always talks like that and he's funny because he wears a turban well in the cozy atmosphere of Edinburgh the television professionals may think ethnic humor about blacks who work too hard scrounge off the dole and live two families in a room is just entertainment the fact remains that in Britain today this is what most white people believe about blacks and the fact that television is always making jokes about it makes them feel justified in despising black people. The comedy makes it okay, natural, acceptable. If you think this is an exaggeration, look at the way exactly the same attitudes dominate the outlook of serious television documentary makers when they deal with what they like to call racial problems. For instance, when Philip Tibbenham and the Tonight team went down to darkest Blackburn, they made a joke about blacks and overcrowding the starting point of their investigation. Predictably, the Asian populations drifted into its own ghetto, sprawling on either side of a long road called Wally Range. The standing local joke is for bus drivers to announce it as the Khyber Pass. But part of the problem in Blackburn is that some immigrants are on the move. This used to be a solid immigrant area, but it's been demolished under a slum clearance program. That's meant that some Asians have spilt over into adjacent white working class areas. And there are those who don't like it one bit. This Tonight Report and Mind Your Language both start from the same assumption. The problem isn't the hostility which Asians face when they move out of the ghetto, but the fact that they're spilling out into adjacent white working class neighborhoods. Blackburn's problem is that some immigrants are on the move. In political terms, it led to something quite startling for Blackburn. At the recent local elections in St. Thomas's ward, normally regarded as totally safe for Labour, John Kingsley Reid, chairman of the ultra-right-wing National Party, came top of the poll. Here comes the John Wayne of racism striding out of the West. For a man who didn't form his party until earlier this year, Kingsley Reid's achievement has been remarkable. And no one questions that the success has been based on his open distaste for the coloured immigrants and his demands for their immediate repatriation. When did building up a successful racist party become, in the BBC's language of neutrality, a remarkable achievement? Can you imagine a report describing the rise of the Black Panthers as a remarkable achievement? Still, the cameras don't leave us in much doubt where Blackburn and Mr. Reid are concerned. Here he is again, shown as a respectable politician, hard at work in his front room. And he has a story to tell our reporter. I've got many and many... Uh, complaint about immigrants taking the toilets out and actually parceling up their excretion, etc., and sticking it in the back alleys. Here, the freedom of the air is the freedom to allow unsubstantiated racist slander to pour out from the screen over the audience. Now Mr. Reed has the reporter's ear. It's an intimate little scene. The attention he's getting from the reporter lends what he's saying credibility. When last did you see a black person on television getting this undivided attention? Still, as every good BBC reporter knows, when racist allegations become too strong, even they have to counter them. Now, there are lots of disturbing things about this whole Blackburn situation. For example, we asked the local council if they'd investigate 
The allegations are smashed toilets and pipes blocked by offal. And after a thorough search, the health department came back with the answer that there's not a shred of evidence to support either of the stories. I suppose, strictly speaking, this is the famous BBC balance and impartiality in action. Current affairs programmes aren't supposed to express a viewpoint. They have to be impartial. And when the allegations in that Blackburn programme got too outrageous, the reporter did tell us there wasn't a shred of evidence to support them. But formal balance is one thing, and the impression which strong images make is another. This isn't an accusation against a particular reporter. It's a question of how the media as a whole work, and of how television works on the audience. Those last extracts, we had vicious allegations against blacks made in a confidential and authoritative way, and denials tentatively made later by a reporter stumbling up a back street in Blackburn. Which do you think made the stronger, more memorable impact? Even Philip Tibbenham had to admit. But the fact is that the Kingsley Reid version has already gone into the mythology of Blackburn. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people actually believe that it's true. Yes. Thanks to such stories, not thousands, but millions now believe it. And television helped to make those myths believable. And somehow the myths keep creeping back into the program. TV reinforces those myths simply by using them as a colourful lead into the next race story. Just good, strong television. In the next extract, our guide is not a racist politician, but an expert who wrote what is a supposedly impartial report for the police about young blacks and crime in Birmingham. The expert, inevitably white, is an important figure in television documentary because he isn't seen to take sides. He has the authority of a man who knows. The next documentary is from the award-winning Shades of Grey. And listen to the way the expert's piece to camera moves from one stereotype to another. Imagine young West Indians, perhaps born in the early 60s, come onto the labour market just at the worst time, a time of high unemployment, particularly for young people. And then they get perhaps involved with the police in some act of minor delinquency. The police come round, the parents themselves get het up, reject their children, and this act of rejection is very common in many ways. And so, leaving their parents, they go and shack up with others of their kind in squats or in communes. On the one hand, searching for purpose, searching for identity. Other hand, perhaps involved more and more in criminality, acts of violence against the old and defenseless. It's a terrifying scenario. It is indeed. But what's really terrifying is the way the scene is being set. This is the archetypal picture, black communities seen exclusively in terms of crime, unemployment, family breakdown and problems. The problems are always explained by white experts. In fact, racism is a white problem. But from Blackburn to Birmingham to Brent, wherever the television eye turns, it sees the same story. Brent isn't notorious for racial trouble, like Notting Hill, for instance, though it is probably the blackest borough in Britain. Of every ten babies born here, four are non-white. Bob Butterick lives on the huge Stonebridge estate. Here, white families are outnumbered three to one by blacks. What is it that really upsets you about this estate? Well, it's the, the vandalism, the noise. You uh, come out your street door, you ask to be quiet in a nice way, and they just look at you, going white trash. Blacks may outnumber whites by three to one, but the BBC seem to have trouble finding them, since none on the estate are interviewed. The microphone is given to a white resident, and again, the reporter lends a sympathetic, professional ear. Uh, it comes, and uh, afterwards people just use it as a dust doll. How do you know it's black children doing it? Because I look out the door. Would you call that convincing evidence? Was it substantiated by any of the black residents on the estate? It would have been nice to know their view. Instead, we're given a guided tour of the lift shaft and more stories of excreta. White citizens, though, are given the freedom to air their prejudices. What's it like to live here? Absolute hell. 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 Are whites going? This is a program where the black majority, who are said to be the problem, are invisible. And the whites, who are having the problem, hold the camera. No one questioned whether you only find rundown condition and social problems on housing estates where blacks are in the majority. It isn't only what the media say. It's what they don't say, but take for granted. Whenever programs are made about blacks, the starting point is always numbers. 
and there's nothing that factual television loves so much as a good solid number, unless it's a comparison between two numbers and a bit of zappy graphic work. Because dealing with large figures is notoriously muddling, we've devised a way of illustrating numbers. We're taking Wembley Stadium as a symbol to represent 100,000 people. Now, how big is Britain's non-white population? According to government figures, 1,800,000. That's the reality. So, now it's not just streets full or rooms full of blacks, they're counting them in stadiums. What other social group would the media dare to count in that way? Jews? Catholics? How many Wembley stadiums of Australians, Canadians or white Rhodesians do you think there are in Britain today? Of course, a number is a fact. And current affairs television loves a fact because you can't quarrel with it. It must be true. Can you remember, as a matter of fact, how many Wembley stadiums the Blacks and Asians filled up? Now for the public perception of those in our sample willing to make an estimate, two-thirds thought there were more non-whites in the country than there actually are. As many as 14% overestimated wildly thought the number of non-whites has reached 10 million or more. Perhaps we get our numbers wrong because we get a steady diet of documentaries from Blackburn, Birmingham and Brent on the so-called immigration problem. Of course, as soon as you say numbers, it doesn't matter how you wrap it up. There's only one lesson to be drawn. The numbers are growing. There are too many of them. Here's something better than a number. A number plus an expert. To do this, we've commissioned a special assessment by a man who has no political acts to grind, who is not involved with race relations or with the government. So that's real neutrality for you. But what's his story? He's a population statistician. The fertility consequences can be seen much more clearly if we have a look at the completed family sizes. This completed family... But the main reason the fertility expert's on the program is because he knows how fast people breed. He lends an air of authority to the numbers game. And where blacks are concerned, the only problem is, how many of them are there going to be? Which is the major question of Asian fertility. The Asians are the significant factor in the future change. Let's give the media the benefit of the doubt. Just suppose the aim of that program was to debunk the myth about black numbers. In fact, if you always only talk about blacks in relation to numbers, the audience cannot help but think that that must be the problem. The possibility that the problem might lie with white society is never considered. There's only an inch or two of film between those absurdly scientific Wembley stadiums and the emotive language of the racists about Britain being swamped by people of an alien culture. And if numbers is the problem, then repatriation must be the answer. Whether you like it or not, that's a racist logic. That's what the emotive language of British racism feeds on. Immigrants equal blacks equals too many of them equals send them back. This chain of reasoning has dominated the so-called immigration debate at least since 1968 when Mr. Powell first stated the so-called facts and drew the deductions about black people in Britain. Here he is being interviewed with great reverence by that well-known Canadian immigrant, Professor Robert Mackenzie. Mr. Powell, we're here in the room in which you made your most famous speech probably on immigration in 1968 now, the campaign to restrict immigration had been underway from the mid-50s. Now, after a decade of saturation coverage like that, Powell and his views have been made respectable by television. It's not just that whenever the media debates race, they turn to Powell. The fact is that the debate starts from Powell's racist chain of reasoning. We'll either have gone or we'll slip out from under somehow. A harsh prediction from Enoch Powell. Is he right or wrong? And is it a matter of figures? Tonight, we're going to examine the number of non-white... Powell is now the media's superstar on race. And everybody defers to his opinion as if it were gospel truth. He defines the terms. He sets the agenda. He's helped to ensure that the question is the question of immigration. A ritual occasion, like a cross between Westminster Cathedral and the Old Bailey. On the throne, the most neutral of neutral chairmen. Good evening. Welcome to our debate for the next 90 minutes on the topical, difficult, and important question of immigration. Here beside me is the Home Secretary... The question of immigration was the big prestige media production on race relations. For its 90 minutes, it was obsessed by the questions of numbers and repatriation. 
And the guest of honor setting the agenda again. There's Mr. Enoch Powell, for instance, who almost exactly ten years ago in Birmingham made the first and most sensational of his many... Mr. Powell, I may, may say, he has said, and he'll speak for himself this evening, that these figures, 40... 40 Let me put a point to you on which Mr. Enoch Powell is certain, and he may be able to follow it up later. He has said many times, so long as there is in this country a large new Commonwealth population, and it's yes. what Mr. Powell is saying, yes. forget about these numbers of trickled people coming in and Why? whether they're wives and so on, the fact is you're going to get immigration going on as long as you've got a big... How would you reduce the numbers from being far too many to being very much less? In other words, the numbers living here has got to be reduced by some something called repatriation or resettlement, which uh, Mr. Powell and others... In the advocate. course of transition. Now, I want if to come, he, can if I, he'd been living next to Polish on. Jews... I want to bring you back to what you were about to talk about, namely Mr. Powell's argument for repatriation, which is our uh, final theme, and I want you to... Uh, I say, Mr. Lyon, in one further answer, whether you agree with Mr. Powell with vigor and eloquence... Anyone who tried to change the terms of this debate got short shrift from the chair. Uh, hold on a moment. Co hold on a moment, will you please... It? Hold on a moment. Uh, you are Councillor Walker? That's right. And where do you come from? Camden. And would you please say what you have to say? So I that would I love to. You haven't Some given us a like chance. chance. I can't. There are a lot more people in this certainly. room who could all speak at once. Certainly, but you have taken the front bench rather preponderantly. Well, that was like what you were here. That yeah. was what you were told would happen. You yeah. shouldn't have come if you wanted to hold the floor yourself I'm all not the time. not wanting to Okay, go I'm ahead, Mr. Walker. For free speech. As soon as you start defining black issues in terms of numbers and repatriation, you play straight into the hands of extremist racist groups with their solution of forced repatriation. And in recent months, the media has given increasing airtime to these racist groups. This is a change in BBC policy from the days of Sir Hugh Green, he said the BBC couldn't be neutral between racism and anti-racism. The present chairman of the BBC, Sir Michael Swan, thinks otherwise. I believe it is vital to display the rhetoric of the National Front. Who knows, exposure may even persuade them to alter their tune. What he's really saying is that extreme races have become part of balance, an acceptable point of view within the spectrum of political opinions. Can you imagine the media displaying the rhetoric of, say, black revolutionaries, on the grounds that exposure may even persuade them to change their tune. Well, displaying the rhetoric of the National Front has now become a respectable studio chat between two white equals, allowing the racists to spell out their propaganda to millions. You have a plan which you've already uh, mentioned to me, and this comes out of your policy document, of uh, advising the repatriation, I'm quoting now, by the most humane means possible of those coloured Im immigrants already here, together with their descendants and dependents. Yes. How many people is that? There was no challenge there on what forcible repatriation actually means. How far away is this from a balanced discussion on whether to repatriate people by air or by sea? That interview continued in the same cosy vein with Webster of the National Front reminiscing unchallenged about his Nazi past. This next interview hardly exposes the rhetoric of racism any better. David Duke of the Ku Klux Klan, wanted by the Home Office and the police as an illegal entrant, is actually in a television studio. You are reported as having a message for the people of Britain. What is your message to the people of Britain, essentially? One of the main things is that they're not alone, that there are white people all over the globe that, that sympathize with... When last did you hear a television interviewer say, Mr. Fidel Castro, I understand you have a message for the British people. This isn't giving the racists enough rope to hang themselves with. It's allowing them to get away with murder, and all the time in the name of balance and good journalism. In the name of balance, the stronger racism becomes, the more airtime it gets. And in the name of balance, whatever that term may mean, you'd expect them to give equal treatment to the anti-racists. So take a look at these extracts from one of the few reports about the Anti-Nazi League, Britain's biggest anti-racist umbrella organization. Using all the tricks of the advertising trade, the message of the League is, anti-racism is good for you. It's got laughs, it's got style. You can even set it to music. The League claims a membership of 30,000, and within that, a complex network of small groups actively selling its message. But do they really exist, except on days like this, at free concerts? For example, it's difficult to actually meet a skateboarder against racism, or to find really dedicated followers who haven't just added one more protest slogan to a very long list. For the school kids alone, it's the first slogan they've adopted. There's genuine... 
So, fighting racism is seen as a con trick, using gimmicks to seduce naive school kids who don't really understand what racism is about. According to the Tonight film, the Anti-Nazi League is a cunning, manipulative organization little better than the racist forces they oppose. Here's the final message of this program about people who are fighting racism. How effective has the League really been? At a time when electoral support for the National Front has declined, violent racial hatred is increasing. There are daily assaults on Asians in London's East End, and just a few days ago in Bradford, a shotgun attack on an Asian restaurant. The badges and carnivals of the League have made no impact on the growing problem of hidden prejudice, which prefers another kind of badge. This film story works to make the Anti-Nazi League ineffective. And even with racism on the increase, there's little coverage of any other anti-racist organizations, the ones run by blacks for themselves, for example. We'd like to show you one more piece of humbug from the BBC's film about the Anti-Nazi League. But the League does boast of support we know it doesn't have. Its most controversial campaign is to get the National Front banned from television screens. And the League claims widespread support amongst broadcasting staff. As a matter of record, Sally Hardcastle apart, a growing number of media workers are opposed to the National Front getting free airtime. And the report was wrong about the campaign, which is not to keep the National Front off the air, but against the kind of uncritical coverage we've seen earlier. The executive of the National Union of Journalists has come out strongly against the Pull the Plugs campaign, calling it censorship. Well, let's talk about censorship. The BBC have effectively tried to censor the programme we're making today. The corporation's news department has denied us access to any of their material. Independent television news and many commercial companies have been similarly obstructive. Why this interference? Here's what the BBC's head of news, Alan Prothero, said about the issue at a committee meeting of news and current affairs editors. Why should an organization, the campaign against racism in the media, which might well accuse myself and my staff of racism, be given privileged treatment? Why indeed? But is it a privilege to try and deal in a half an hour with literally thousands of hours of television broadcast each year? And who's really privileged when the news is above criticism? Here's the justification of the ban given us by the BBC's chairman, Sir Michael Swan. We are not prepared to release news film to fulfill an avowedly partial purpose unless we are totally reassured about the context and form in which it is to be used. Our concern in this program is that the unavowedly but dangerously partial attitudes of the BBC should not be placed above suspicion. Racism has never been put in a critical context by the media in this country. When it comes to fighting racism, the media are part of the problem. They perpetuate myths and stereotypes about black people. They lie by omission, distortion and selection. They give racists inflated importance and respectability. But what does all this mean to you? The most important thing we're saying is don't trust the media. Don't take television, the press, radio at face value, and above all, don't take them sitting down. The campaign against racism in the media is made up of people who work in the press and broadcasting, but the media are too important to be left to the professionals. You can do something about the media, and you can get your voice heard, especially if it's organized. If you want to know how the campaign against racism in the media is organizing, here's our address. Campaign Against Racism in the Media, P.O. Box 50, London, N1. It seems tragic and ironic that we, as broadcasters and journalists, have had to go through the back door of Open Door to make this program. In this half-hour program, we haven't even touched on foreign coverage, the whiter-than-white -white coverage of the police, the employment of blacks in television, black culture, or news bias in press and TV. We believe these issues should be raised in mainstream television programs. But will they be? I guess this is where we hand editorial control back to the BBC.
The BBC regrets that the Open Door programme broadcast on the 1st and 4th of March this year by the campaign against racism in the media could be taken as implying that Mr Robin Day had conducted a programme about immigration with a racist bias. The BBC considers that any such implication would be wholly unjustified. The BBC also regrets that the Open Door programme could similarly be taken to mean that Mr Ludovic Kennedy had conducted an interview with a National Front spokesman with a racist bias and that a number of others named had presented programmes with a similar bias. The BBC wishes to dissociate itself from any such suggestions which it considers to be entirely without foundation. Well, Chris, what was the reaction to this? I can't imagine the media really being very appreciative of what you did to them. No, but we wanted to keep it within the bounds of reason, and we hoped we could goad our peers into actually having an open debate about it. I mean, the television is never criticised. Uh, they're too, you know, they absolutely believe they're right to criticise others, but when the spotlight is turned on them, wow, you know, it really was a question of investigation of an organisation above suspicion. I mean, that's the BBC. <laughs> Um, so um, there was at one level absolute outrage. The sequence with Robin Day, um, who did that, who was chairing the debate, that major debate on immigration, um, um, who must be explained is the equivalent of Walter Cronkite. He's now been knighted. He's Sir Robin oh. Day. Uh, he was outraged, and he wrote to the head of the BBC. He insisted his lawyers come and see it, and for days afterwards, barristers and lawyers. In fact, their bill for looking at this tape was more than the cost of making the film in the first place. And then to placate the guy, because there's nothing the BBC could say, this is an access programme, um, you know, this, this is not under our editorial control. So um, that, at the very end, the announcement that's made by the continuity announcer sort of decrying the criticism, saying that he was racist, that he wrote and insisted that they broadcast. So even Robin Day, who has a show every night, who presents his views nationwide, you know, still insisted on the right of reply after our little kind of piece shooters against the machine gunners program. Uh, after that, the BBC suddenly decided that they had, uh, that the program was, had joint copyright over it. Oh. So, um, they just, and they'd never uh, used their right of veto before, but they suddenly decided this time they weren't going to let us have our own program back. Because one of the things we made the program for was not only to show it on the access spot, but it was to use it in groups, in classrooms, and use the, have the television showing as a shop window so people could use the program subsequently. Well, needless to say, the BBC wasn't too anxious for this program to be shown in schools and various other places. So after a lot of argy-bargy, and this went on for months, which was very unfortunate for us because all the interest that had been gained through showing it was cooling off, and, uh, and they decided that we could show this program as long as we, we could have this program as long as we only showed it to members of our own group. <laughs> so, we, you know, like, well, our group have made this. We're fairly familiar with this program. And though we like ourselves, we didn't have plans of watching it every morning when we got up. So um, we made a big play of this on our flyers. So we said, the only way you can see this program, uh, the BBC is banned, is by joining our organization, you see. So for oh, what so you can, a recruitment That's thing. right, which you can do for free. Um, and, uh, and in fact, a racist organization got hold of this and wrote to the BBC saying, do you know what this group are doing with this program? They're not actually showing it to themselves. They're actually uh, allowing other people to see it. So we got into this whole correspondence with the BBC about, you know, are you showing it? So we said, we'll raise it our national convention that somebody's shown this to somebody not in our group and it must stop henceforth. <laughs> the BBC are getting very, very cross about this. Well, we, you can go back and tell them it's being seen on That's public right. access here in the United <laughs> States absolutely. in various places. And we'll pro 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 proliferate it as much as we can, too. Yeah. Well, thank you for being with us. Pleasure. And bring back uh, any more tapes you have whenever you can. Well done. Well done. I see we have time for a couple of more news stories. Uh, there's another, another article in the Washington Post uh, weekly about the Kissinger panel. And this article is, is questioning whether the report can silence the majority opposition to Mr. Reagan's shoot em up agenda for Central America. <laughs> they reported the Washington Post and ABC News did a poll in 82 and 83 that found that 70% or more of, public, of the public opposed the Reagan administration plans to increase military aid to El Salvador. That didn't stop them, of course. 
Uh, this article goes on to say that this, the Kissinger Commission, is the most recent of a series of examples of how President Reagan moves to deflect criticism from himself as he attempts to implement unpopular policies. Now, they also mentioned uh, the Commission for Social Security Legislation and the Scowcroft Commission, which rammed through the MX missile. So this is the third time this year that Mr. Reagan has relied upon a commission of quote-unquote bipartisan members to back his policies up. Uh, the commission itself says that the biggest problem is the people in this country are ignorant. They just uh, don't know enough <laughs> about it. They say widespread ignorance about the area in this country is an obstacle, indeed a danger. Well, there is some truth to that. Uh, another poll done by the Washington Post said that only 25% of the people in this country are aware that we are on the government side in El Salvador and on the rebel side in Nicaragua. So there isn't, there hasn't been a whole lot of reporting going on here. Let me give you the results of some of the questions they asked in this poll. For instance, what would you say is a greater danger to the United States? The spread of communism in Central America because the U.S. doesn't do enough to stop it? <laughs> or the U.S. becoming too entangled in internal Central American problems as a result of trying to stop the spread of communism. 55% of the people said that U.S. entanglement's a bigger problem. 34% said that the spread of communi communism is a bigger problem. Another question, do you tend to agree or disagree that the United States interferes improperly in the internal affairs of Latin American countries? 49% said, yes, we do interfere, interfere too much. And only 37% said, no, we don't interfere. Yeah. And finally, the Reagan administration wants to send an increased amount of military equipment and weapons to the government of El Salvador. Do you approve or disapprove? 72% in March 82 disapproved. In March 83, 70% said, no, we don't want to send it there. And, and as of March 1983, only 19% of people said that we should be sending weapons. So there was a critique of the Kissinger Commission report by Robert White, who is the former U.S. ambassador to El Salvador, who said in a report that was released last Sunday that since pre President Reagan took office, the U.S. has committed $228 million in military aid to El Salvador, and during this period, the Salvadorian military, security, and death squads have murdered over 20,000 unarmed civilians, and that up to this point in time, there's not been one legal prosecution for any of these deaths. So the human rights violations by the El Salvadorian government have been massive. It's very interesting, though, in studying the American power structure all these years, I found that any time that a, an administration feels like it may be in trouble with a certain bill or a, or a certain subject, it'll haul out a special commission, and they'll call it a Blue Ribbon Commission, right? Blue Ribbon because they have people from the uh, uh, central part of the American establishment. The Blue Bloods. The Blue Bloods, the people who've been running the country for so long. So they'll, they'll haul out this commission, and then mainly it's to help deflect or to decrease or eliminate any type of criticism of that particular thing, and also to, uh, to preempt or to co-opt any type of congressional action which may come up. Suddenly they'll say, well, it's a bipartisan Blue Ribbon Commission, so boys don't mess with that. <laughs> but it's interesting that uh, this fact has been pointed out for the first time I've seen on the, in the, on the television for the first time. And not only that, the Wall Street Journal the other day ran an, uh, an editorial along the same lines. They say that political decisions, particularly the thorny ones, are being relegated to the smoke-filled rooms once again. Huh. That's Alternative Views for this evening. Alternative Views is a production of the Alternative Information Network, P.O. Box 7279, Austin, Texas, 78712. Good night.